Professor Elder, could, could you talk a little bit about the broad division between Sunni and Shia Muslims throughout the Muslim world? Sure. Uh, I had the fortune of growing up in a, in a Shiite Muslim country. I didn't realize as I was growing up that it was a Shiite Muslim country. I was just aware it was a Muslim country. But I was aware that on the 10th of Mohram, the city was in great mourning, whichever city I was in. Most of my boyhood I spent in Tehran. And on that day, it was a very somber day. The streets were filled with people who were beating their breasts and, and calling out to Hassan or Hussein. Uh, but I, at that point, I wasn't aware that there was all that much difference between Shiites and Sunnis. It wasn't actually till I sort of came out of Iran and realized that there's most of the world is not Shiite uh, that I was aware that I was seeing kind of a, perhaps a five or ten percent of the way Muslims respond, and that most Muslims are Sunnis and they don't observe the same kind of celebrations. The next personal experience I had with the Shiite Sunni difference was uh, two years when I was living in a village in India. And then the month of Muharram came, and I was suddenly aware of the fact that my village Muslims were not taking part in Muharram. There was a village about a mile away, uh, which was a Shiite village, and starting on the first night of the month, they began beating drums all night long. And then uh, the ninth of Muharram, I guess it was, some men came from the Shiite village and asked if I could take photographs. So I went with them and watched the procession. And indeed, they, there were little boys who had chains, which they sort of whip over their shoulders. And on the ends of the chains were little cut pieces of metal so that as they slapped their shoulders, it would prick the back and eventually get a little bit of blood going. But the dramatic thing was the young men, uh, they, there were sort of, I would skip between 18 and 21, something, you know, very, very masculine young men. And they had decided that they were going to cut. Uh, and at a certain point, they would get, they would stop it. The procession was sort of going through the village. They were carrying these, uh, these replicas of the tomb of, of the grave, of the, of the, of the, of the uh, casket of Hussein. Uh, they, called, they were called tazias. And they would stop at a corner when another group would come in with perhaps their tazia. These were made out of bamboo and colored paper. And then the young men would begin to cut their foreheads. The knives were probably you know, 12, 18 inches long, butcher knives probably, and then they would just whack their foreheads uh, about that point so the hair would come off in part and the blood would come down. They all were wearing white so that as the blood began to run down their chins and then onto their chest, their shirts became completely red. Uh, and this would go on until older men uh, who were with them would sort of say, okay, that's enough, uh, and then there would be a pause. They bring water and they sort of rinse off uh, the blood, and then they go to perhaps the next intersection of the village and do it all over again with perhaps the young men from that village. So I did photograph the whole thing, and I was able to give them copies of it. They were very pleased with it. Uh, I also photographed the what they called the Karbala, which was a tank in the village, and they called it Karbala, uh, the site of the massacre of Hussein. And they took these tazias and put them into the tank and then sort of left them there as though they were being buried for a while. Uh, and then, in, indeed, in the, once they were in the water, they disintegrated, so there wasn't very much left. Uh, and then they went back uh, with uh, slapping their chests and saying, Hassan Hussein, Hassan Hussein. So that was the, the second experience. And it was clear that the Sunnis in my village were not observing Moram, and the Shiites in the next village were. Uh, years later, after I actually had begun to study Islam much more carefully, uh, what triggered that was interesting in itself. Uh, having come from Iran, I was aware that when the Ayatollah Khomeini came in and the uh, Shah left, that uh, there was a fair amount of resentment in the United States and in Iran about the relationship between the two. And then all of a sudden, there were these hostages, where people in the U.S. Embassy were taken hostage by people in Tehran. And there was huge anger in the United States because you are never supposed to take, do something like that to diplomatic representatives. And I remember coming back from the parking lot <clears throat> on the campus one day and somebody had spray painted onto the sidewalk, nuke Iran. And I thought, you know, if there's somebody on this campus who thinks that, and I know at, as much about Islam as I do, I have a responsibility to know much more and start teaching courses on it. So I was able to get a semester off uh, and do much more reading so that when I did 
start this course called The Social Structure of Muslim Societies. I had some basis for it. The most recent event where the Shuni, Sunni Shi, I think, came in was about five or six years ago when one of my students uh, who is teaching in Sweden wanted to make a documentary film on Muharram and Benares. And both he and I thought this would be interesting because in Benares, which is a holy Hindu city, probably a quarter or maybe even a third of the population are Muslims. They're, they're overlooked because Benares is a sacred Hindu city and the Ganges River comes and there are big Hindu celebrations. But a lot of people in Benares are Muslims. So uh, my student, <coughs> who had al also made some documentary films, uh, combined with me to get the funding and so on to make the film. And we had sort of anticipated that when the procession on the 10th of Muharram came, where the Shiite Muslims would be going through the Sunni neighborhoods, that there just could be some resentment. Uh, I had read some of the British district gazetteers, and in this part of, uh, of Uttar Pradesh, they said often this was the tensest time of the year because all you had to have happen was some Sunni to insult some Shiite or vice versa, and then a riot could break out and neighbors could begin to attack each other. So often they'd have full police out on the 10th of Muharram just to prevent this kind of thing. So we sort of expected that would be the case, and we were prepared to talk to both the Shiites and the Sunnis about what happened. And then what happened was truly remarkable. Uh, we began interviewing people several uh, weeks before this happened uh, to get their sense of what, we got, what the crisis would be. And there just didn't seem to be any crisis. You know, for one set of people, for the Shiites, this is the, the, the death of, of Imam Hussein, the grandson of the prophet, a horrible murder. He, with a small band of followers, was completely destroyed uh, by the Sunnis. Uh, and the Sunnis felt that the Shiites were introducing a false category into the Imam process by saying you had to be related in terms of heredity to the Prophet. And the Sunni says that is a totally inappropriate requirement. We're trying to pick the most ethical person, the most moral person. And so you Shiites are off on the wrong tangent, and we don't want that to continue. So there's a real kind of issue of the, the leadership following the death of the Prophet. Well, the processions were being organized, and it was clear that the Sunnis were interpreting this tragic event not so much as a collision on a principle of leadership, but that it was a tragedy because Muslims were killing Muslims. And that was whatever other consideration might be in the air, that was the most tragic. And so from the very beginning, they, the Sunnis said, we're observing this because it was a tragedy for any Muslim to kill any Muslim for whatever reason. And the Shiites were observing it because it was a death of Imam Hussein. So from the very beginning, it was a collective Muslim and Muslim uh, offer. For decades, in fact, probably for centuries, Hindus had also participated in the processions. Uh, there are various ways in which they would take stories from the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, where a mother had lost her sons, and the sort of grief that comes to anybody. Uh, but more than that, uh, the various Hindu groups had themselves built these tazias, these caskets, and then they would join the parade. So you'd have the Shiites with their tazias, and then Hindus with their tazias, both of them mourning the loss of anybody and the, the grief that that causes, and then proceeding together all the way to the, the Karbala, the end of the whole procession. The very final sequence Again, we had not anticipated. The last night of the celebration, in the streets of Benares, they, they light fires, and so there are coals on the street corners. And it's a kind of courageous thing. It's, it's in the same analog of cutting your forehead or whipping your back to inflict suffering on yourself. And these were hot coals, and then courageous young Muslim men ran through them to show that they weren't afraid of suffering. And the Shiites did it, and the Sunnis did it, and then the Hindu young men did it as well. So in the last sequence in the film, it was this great coming together of young men of all faiths saying that all of us have the same sort of willingness to sacrifice or suffer uh, for those causes that we believe in. 